All right, welcome to The Rock. Um, welcome to Mod 2. So, um, what I'm going to be doing is, uh, remember when, um, kind of beginning of Mod 1, I gave that uh, scary, intimidating thing, or maybe Damon did it with you guys, uh, where we did the many-to-many -many relationship by hand, and we said, all right, now you have to do that in two weeks. This is that thing. So nobody should be able to do any of this right now. Um, and... Uh, if you can't do it by the end of this hour, like you're right on track. Nobody should be able to do it then either. Uh, goal is to give you an idea of what the destination looks like, where we're going. Um, the demo I'm going to do for you is like uh, frightfully similar to what the code challenge will be next week. Uh, but we have these kind of disparate topics here, and hopefully this gives you some sense of how they connect. Um, I will also say that mod two is the hardest mod. Like of the five, I think two is the most like academically brutal. Uh, and part of that is uh, it's also the one that we do the most different from um, traditional flat iron. And you'll notice that when you look in LearnCo, probably 95% of the labs for this are mod three labs. Uh, so we mostly switched what traditional mod 2 and traditional mod 3 are. Uh, and the reason why is a traditional flat iron mod 2 picks up um, more or less right where we left off. And what we do is we build, come on, man. We do things like build servers from scratch. Um, we learn Sinatra. Like the entire first two weeks of mod two are this. If we've got 15 weeks to make you employable, like neither of those make the cut. Uh, you will probably never do either of those things again in your career. And I don't think they're all that useful for learning how to make APIs either. The next thing you do is you spend one week on Rails dot 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 um, with server-side templating, which in 2020 is probably not a thing that you're going to do a whole lot of. It is how like all web apps worked for like 15 years, um, but it's not olden times, it's present day. And <laughs> in present day, we don't do a whole lot of this. And then the mod ends. And so uh, Damon and I uh, said, hey, if we only have 15 weeks, I can think of a way more useful way to spend three of them. And so we sort of accelerated mod three forward. Uh, we're taking the uh, parts of like Rails APIs and stuff that are highly relevant to what you do, moving those up. And then in mod three, we get to go a little bit deeper in some things that the traditional Flatiron curriculum either ignores or just glosses over and are actually super useful. Um, so that's why we're doing it this way. So if you're looking at a lab and you see it's in mod three and learn, that's why. Um, part of the trade-off though is we use the same mod two code challenge that uh, Flatiron traditionally uses. And to make it work with this way more authentic way to get through this content, we kind of got to cram it in. So there's a ton of content in mod two, and it's like all over the place. But by the end of mod two, you're a full stack developer. And then we just spend six more weeks getting better at being full stack developers. Um, and overall, I think this is a much better use of your three weeks. Cool, any questions before we get started? <laughs> what? I'm feeling, like, I'm feeling confident, like, should I not? <laughs> um, so, no, not necessarily. Especially if you have a background in, like, um, like, website building and stuff. That's a lot of this mod. It's not all of it. But, like, basic JS stuff, basic website stuff, um, uh, basic DOM stuff. There's a pretty decent chance that you've done some of this before you came here. Totally fine. Um, like, we can always find a way to make it kick your ass more, uh, and you'll learn stuff from it. Some of the networking stuff, uh, 
will likely be new to you, some of the fetch stuff will likely be new to you, and the Rails API stuff um, will also probably be pretty new to you. Cool, what else? Yeah, so are we the first cohort that you kind of moved in or accelerated? No, you're the fifth cohort, actually. Oh, okay. uh, we're, we're pretty robust on this by this point. And mod two has always been good. Mod three has changed a lot in response to that. So we started out crazy loose on that. We said, okay, well, we have these like three free weeks now. What do you want them to be? Um, and I don't, I don't think that it was a, a waste. In fact, like we got, actually got a ton of work done in that like very free form one, but it was massively stressful, um, I think, for a lot of people. And so now uh, we've focused mod three a ton and we cut a lot of things out of it that were like nice to haves. And we like sort of doubled down on the stuff that I really want you to leave this program with. So mod two has always been pretty good, but uh, mod three has improved a lot the last five times we've done it. Good question, what else? Cool, let's build some websites. So um, first thing that we do is we build simple APIs. And um, you don't need to follow along with this. I wouldn't even necessarily recommend taking notes, just, uh, just watch. So there's a whole big mess there. We'll call this mod to overview. Okay, so um, let's say I wanted to build an API. Conceptually, what we're doing here is we'll have a part that the user interacts with in a browser, and it's gonna talk to data. Can you tell that I'm writing this on an incline? <laughs> um, on a server that's talking to a database, and it's gonna ask for some of that data, and the server's gonna give it back. So this is what this entire mod is, is basically that diagram. So I'm gonna start with this server part. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say uh, Rails new, uh, we'll call this mod to backend. And then I'm going to use the correct version of Ruby. Try that again. Cool. So Rails, uh, it's in Ruby. It's the same programming language that you were working with in mod one, but uh, we get tons of stuff out of the box that makes this significantly more useful for us. So um, it is installing all that stuff right now. And if I look in my empty folder, I've got this mod two backend and look at all these folders, look at all these files. Uh, this is Rails. Uh, and what's kind of cool about this is every Rails app looks like this. Um, small ones, big ones, um, amateur ones, pro ones, they're all sort of structured the same way. Now it's very intimidating, like just how many like weirdo files there are in here. You don't actually have to work with all that many of them uh, in this program. And what's extra neat about it is we get a lot of built-in tools that uh, help us with stuff. So I can say Rails S, oops, actually I did this wrong. Um, I did this the old mod two way, hang on. Rails new mod two backend dash dash API. I was about to troll myself in front of all of you. So I can Rails S this and oops, I need to actually go into it. I can Rails S this. Cool. And I have a working API server. Just like that. But it doesn't do anything yet. So I can say something like, uh, give me a noun. What's a noun we're gonna do this Balloon. demo with? Balloon, love it. Um, we're gonna make a model for a balloon. Come on. We're gonna make a model for a balloon. We're gonna go to the right folder. 
Then we're going to make a model for a balloon. And it made some files for us. So that complicated uh, snake's nest of a directory structure, it's kind of handling all that complexity for us. Then we can say, hey, I want to make a controller called balloons. What are models? What are controllers? <gasps> Stay tuned. Um, so then we can hop into the router We say, hey, anytime you make a get request to balloons, I want you to send that request over to balloons um, index action. This is just Ruby. If I put in all the other uh, syntax noise in here, that's a function call, that's an argument, that's a hash. Like, we know how to read that, right? We do that kind of stuff all day. So Rails people write it like that. So uh, all right, I've got this, um, uh, this route. I'm going to go over to that controller that I made. I said I wanted an index. So I'm going to say, hey, give me all of the balloons, which I can get from balloon dot all, and I want you to send them back to me. Okay, all right, and then, um, all right, what is a balloon? Well, a balloon is something, hey, wait a minute, that's familiar. We did that kind of stuff. We were doing that kind of stuff like last week. So I could say it should have a string called color. And I got this migration. Can I run this migration? Well, yes, I can. So do Rails DB migrate. Now I got a balloons table in my database. If you don't believe me, I can even SQLite into it and say, hey, um, why don't you dot schema? What do I got? Well, you know, I got balloons. Um, cool. So what about my like actual model? Hey, this is kind of like that active record stuff we were doing towards the end of mod one. So um, last thing we're going to do on this, I can say balloon.create color red. Green, blue. So I've got seeds now, you know, just like before. And if I throw those into the database, then I could do something like select all from balloons. And I see my red, green, and blue balloons. More importantly, I can go to this URL in the browser and see my balloons. This is the first thing that we're trying to get comfortable with in this mod. So if I look at that diagram, the thing that I just did was this part and this part. Rails, database, Rails, database. So a browser can ask a server for stuff from the database. Very cool, very cool. So next thing we need to do is get that browser to read those balloons and make them show up on a page. Doug. Did um, Cloud Rails, did, did it just wrap the rake command or just calling rake or whatever? Rake is dead. Um, the uh, modern versions of uh, Rails yeah, wrap the commands. like. They kind of like resorbed them. Uh, but rake isn't a separate command anymore. Cool. What else? Is the server and database still locally on your computer? It is. Uh, so you can't get to them, but I can. But the idea is that one of these days, I deploy this out to the world wide web, 
and now other World Wide Web applications can get that data. What else? Other questions so far? Yeah, Doug. So the 3,000, that's a port number? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And it happens to be the default for um, the Rails server. I can change it. I can say Rails S dash P 5,000. And now I'm serving it on 5,000. What else? Oh, what a great question. So, all those answers will be revealed to you when we start talking about networking. But uh, basically, it's a, it's a way for uh, two computers to talk to each other. Uh, and you can talk with more than one uh, other computer. You say, I'm talking to you on 3,000. I'm talking to Rachel on 5,000. Good question. What else? Cool, let's take a look at the browser side of this. So over here, all that's hanging out in that mod2 backend folder. I'm also gonna make one called mod2 frontend. And I'm gonna make an index.html file, an app.js file, and a style.css file. And I'm gonna throw those in this uh, folder. So. Um, nothing up this sleeve, nothing up this sleeve. Now, um, I can run a command called light server that will make those show up. So on 3001, I've got the future home for my website. And if I hop into that folder, over in the index.html, you may have worked with index or, uh, sorry, HTML files before, probably did some of it in the pre-work, you may have done it in uh, your life outside of here. What I don't want you to think though, is that HTML is dumb, simple baby stuff. And I think that's heavily implied by some of the flat iron curriculum as like, it is if you don't do it very well. <laughs> but there's a ton of complexity to HTML. And so if you do have a background in this, I'd love to scratch a little bit deeper because um, there's, there's some cool stuff uh, with HTML, especially regarding semantics, accessibility, and uh, it would break my heart if you went out into the job world uh, writing div soup like so many shitwad <laughs> developers do. Mod to overview, meta char set UTF, Eight, and we'll say this is um, balloons. So uh, just by typing that thing, I can make something show up on a page. Pretty cool. What would be even cooler is if I could make the balloons from that database show up on this page, and that is my actual goal here. So. I can include that gerbil script file that I just wrote. I can also include that style file that I made. Style.css. Oops. Style link. Come on, man. It's Monday for all of us. Um, all right, so let's say, um, all right, I'm gonna show you this now and I wanna show it to you with the hope that I see dramatically fewer uh, projects for the rest of your time here use browser default fonts. Um, please don't use browser default fonts. It's this easy to fix this. So if I go to Google fonts, and, um, this is a neat hack that I learned. You filter them by number of styles. Good typefaces have a ton of styles. Like Montserrat, it's a killer typeface. So we go over here, I copy this link, I go over to style, I paste the link, and then I say 
body font family Montserrat fall back to sans serif and just like that this doesn't look like garbage anymore it's really that easy please don't say you did, ran out of time you didn't I couldn't really figure it out all right so we got that we can give uh, also give the body maybe a little bit more padding all right cool now we're in business so uh, we'll talk about styling a little bit in this mod and then all right so in this JavaScript file this is where I'm going to connect these two things so I've got my app happening over here I want it to talk to my server let's make it talk so we do that with a command called fetch and we're going to have it fetch that um, port 3000 on localhost balloons and we are going to parse the response that it gives back to us and then we are going to take those balloons I'll say the response and first let's just make sure that we've actually got the connection going like so so if I go back over to this browser app and look at my console network error when attempting to fetch resource Probably because the thing I just asked it to do is actually kind of a major security <laughs> issue. No, I changed it back to 3000. So like there's some Rails black magic that to start with, we'll talk more about why we do it this way in mod three. Some of this shit you just memorize and this is one of them. Um, and we'll talk more about where that file is and why you got to do that kind of stuff and that kind of thing. But if I do that and restart my server, oops, something I didn't like. Interesting. Oh, good call. That's exactly it. Way to go. All right, so I do that, and I bundle install. And then there we go. Good looking out. So now if I do that, undefined. Oh, I know why. This is just balloons. Cool, I see an array of balloons. All right, so I've, I've successfully made this loop here. Now I gotta get them to show up in the page. We do that with a thing called DOM manipulation. So for each one of those, I wanna make some balloon elements, and then I'm gonna add them to the page. So I'll say, um, dollar sign balloons is balloons.map balloon and I'll say uh, document.create element uh, div and I'll say that div.inner text is balloon dot color then return the div now I got a whole bunch of balloons so I'll say for I'm gonna make a place to put them so I'll say this is um, That's where balloons go. Uh, 
I'm going to grab that thing that I just made. Uh, collect container. Is document.query selector balloons. And then I'll say for each of those balloon elements that I made, I want you to take each one and add it to the container. This is container.append balloon. Holy shit, those came from a database. And they're showing up in the browser. You're a wizard, Harry! That's full stack development. Um, React apps, all this other kind of shit, they're just fancier versions of doing this. Um, so we made a simple API. Uh, we <coughs> made a website. We did a little bit of Dribble script. We did a little bit of DOM manipulation. We fetched. We did this stuff over a network. Last thing is forms. This is how we make this dynamic. So what we'll do is we'll say, um, 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 uh, if I make a form here, and it has an input, add, Balloon. Uh, this will be a text input, a name of color. So now on my page, I have this, I have this little form. It's another thing that like, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear anything about like, well, I, I ran uh, out of time actually, uh, because this is how you make a form not look stupid. Say input and label display block margin bottom rem. Wow, it's already significantly less stupid. I can say that I want the form uh, to have a width of 200 pixels. And both of these should uh, take up all of that. Hey, weird, not bad. And then over here, I'll say this label sick. And I can say that this should have a margin top of five rems. All right, I've got my form for uh, adding a new balloon. So, it, no, it is on the page. Now we're going to get it to talk to the API. So we're going to say, hey, every time somebody submits this form, I want you to send a post request to localhost 3000. balloons and then over in API land I can say hey anytime I get a post request to balloons why don't you send that over to create create you say well anytime you create something I want you to do balloon.create and I want the color to be uh, params and color, and then I want you to redirect. Once you've done that, I want you to send me back to the site. So we'll redirect to localhost 3001, like so. If you don't do that redirect and you submit that page, what happens? Um, I'll show you. All right, so let's see if it works. All right, I want to add a what my son would call a yayo. All right, what happened? 
Does it actually make the request? Right there. I think I need to uh, pers. No, I am persisting the logs. Oh yeah, it is. Good call. And I've got three yellows now. Um, purple. Cool. There you go. Now we're even writing stuff to the other side. And. That's where you show the forms. This is a ton of stuff, but we're going to go pretty shallow on it. Then we're going to go a lot deeper in mod three. Questions about big concepts in this, what we're doing the next two weeks. Yeah. Can I ask you an entire level question? Sure. Sure. So um, for one, let's say you do go into I iOS development, uh, Android development, something like this. If you do such a thing, this part of it is identical. But you're just not writing for a browser. You are writing uh, for whatever platform. And usually there's um, what are called SDKs that are similar kind of idea. Sometimes even the markup looks quite similar. Um, but they'll have built-in animations and like uh, lots of tools to make it look like it's part of that operating system. But all, the, all of that stuff is the same. Now to your other question, why on earth would somebody do iOS development or Android development if we can just do this in the browser? That's a great question. And Um, if you want to see me talk for just under an hour so you about get all of the fun of playing why the lottery, uh, I don't American think anybody game. should be making uh, Android or iOS apps Absolutely. anymore, uh, TechCrunch disrupt, then, well, I talked about, about that Let's talk about how we hour. got here. How did this happen? It's a brief history of... Uh, of Um, uh, everything from uh, the accelerometer, uh, location, payments, like there's nothing you can't do in a browser that you can do on a mobile device anymore. That wasn't always the case, but it is the case now. It even works offline. Uh, offline apps are totally a thing. A little bit, but in the exact same way that if you're making an iOS app, you're expecting uh, like Apple and Swift to do a lot of the work for you. It's just a different platform. And one of the cool things, and this is the reason like you guys are in this program and we're teaching you these things, is the browser is the coolest fucking technology uh, in the last 30 years. Easily the coolest like app on your computer. Because this solves the Sega versus Nintendo problem. This solves the like, ooh, I don't have one of those. If it runs a browser, it runs your app. That is so cool. This is universal access. Uh, you, want, um, you want your app to work well, with somebody who has like the iPhone 25 in San Francisco and somebody who's on a metered connection in South Africa or something. Cool, it's the same platform. You want to work on a car, you want to work on a watch. If it runs a browser, you can do it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So did that divide start between developing this for browser versus iOS because the iPhone came out before HTML5 was like the standard? I, I talk about that a little bit in that TechCrunch talk, okay. but um, a key piece of information, and if any of you have like dumb buddies who are developers who like have a lot of opinions about <laughs> what we're doing in the program or something like this, uh, you'll probably hear a lot of shit thrown at JavaScript. And some of it's like legitimately justified, most of it isn't in 2020. Uh, but the reason that that's such a common thing is that JavaScript used to be kind of a toy language. Um, so browsers, this is like a quick internet history lesson. 
Anybody know the name of the uh, the first browser? This is before that. We're, we're going back to like CERN. <laughs> Mosaic. Um, so um, Tim Berners-Lee, um, researcher at CERN, uh, wants a way to share documents uh, with other researchers. And so he comes with this uh, idea of like hyperlinked documents over a network. And this thing called a browser that uh, helps you navigate uh, through them. But just a, because uh, when it comes up with the HTML, um, and we have first web browser, first World Wide Web thing. This is like 1991, I think. And so like fairly recently, the internet goes back to the 60s, but the internet is like tubes that connect computers and allow them to talk to each other. Like That's it. Um, the idea of browsers and uh, URLs and all that kind of shit, that's 90s. So Tim Berners-Lee comes up with this uh, uh, browser and uh, then a bunch of other people are like, well shit, uh, the internet is like open for commercial traffic now, which is also like fairly recent. We have this browser, we could sell stuff on this, we could advertise stuff on this, we could have people make their own sites. And so then you get things like CSS, came a couple years later. And, uh, but still just hyperlinked documents, basically. Sign my guest book. And then this period, this really, really interesting, I'm fascinated by this period in uh, internet history. This is like 1995, 1996. Um, just chaos with interactivity. There's this idea that we want to uh, have things happen dynamically on the page. So you load the page, it looks a certain way, and now we want certain things to uh, appear and disappear uh, dynamically, and maybe even ask for something from a server. And so there's so many different opinions on how that should be done. And uh, every different browser vendor, and this is where Netscape comes in, Internet Explorer, um, we have this like competing browser market used to buy these things. You used to go to the store and buy a browser. Um, and uh, each one of them had their own way that you programmed them. Uh, so like the Microsoft had one called LiveScript, I think. Um, Netscape had what would become JavaScript. And there are a whole bunch of like competing ones. Uh, around that same time, there was also, do you remember like installing uh, ActiveX browser extensions? Anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah. So this was the idea that like, okay, cool. Well, you could run Flash in here, which like was a way more robust programming language than any of these things, if you install this extension on top of your browser. Um, and that was how people were trying to uh, run applications in browsers. And what happened is uh, nobody thought much of JavaScript because it did so little and everybody else essentially murdered each other, and all that was left was JavaScript. Um, we got in all these like, different agreements and um, uh, exclusivity things, and all, all these like, legit competitors were killed off by Flash, and JavaScript just kind of hung around. And when Steve Jobs killed Flash in 2005 by saying, like, we're not supporting on Apple products anymore, it's a security fucking nightmare, um, all, all that was left was JavaScript, and we're like, huh. Well, it's kind of cool that everybody in the world is using this, but it's not very good. Uh, so uh, there's a, a big effort in the last 10 years to sort of modernize JavaScript, and now JavaScript is a plenty modern language. It's a pretty robust one, honestly. But it didn't start that way, and it took a while to get there. So if your dumb buddy is like, JavaScript, JavaScript is a shit language. <laughs> like, they probably have some memory from that era. era. Yeah. What about the Sure. So, your browser understands exactly three things. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's it. That's all your browser talks. So, TypeScript, CoffeeScript, all these other things, we call these um, compile-to languages or transpiled languages. You write it in another language, and then 
some magic on your computer turns it into JavaScript. Yeah. So actually, Babel's a little bit different than that even. Babel um, will let you write canonical JavaScript, and it will turn it into the JavaScript that whatever browser you're targeting understands. Because not every JavaScript feature is available in, in every browser. So there's a really cool tool called Can I Use? And you can say something like, hey, does the payments API? Cool. So like behind a flag in Firefox, works in Edge, doesn't work in Internet Explorer, has worked in Chrome since 78. So what you do is, uh, I don't think you can actually do it with the payments API, but you write like JavaScript to the spec and it does magic to turn it into something that all the browsers that you target understand. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Generally not. Um, you, what, what's kind of cool about this is that you don't need to worry about operating systems, just browsers. Now, um, IE and Safari in particular have versions of the browser that are like, um, have deep ties to those operating systems. So you may have those kinds of issues and this like lack of support and whatever else for that browser and it's because of that operating system, but you don't need to worry about the, the operating system itself, just the browser. Um, and, all right, do I need to worry about somebody who's got Vista or whatever? Um, what you can do is you can also look at this and see that the global usage of IE11 is 1.43%. And it has been a drum that I have been beating very hard, not every company has listened to me on this. I'll bet that 1.43% doesn't buy a whole lot of products online. So maybe you don't worry about them so much. Now, there is one major big fucking money pocket that uses IE. Anybody know what it is? Government. The government. Um, Department of Defense, uh, you get a government contract, there's a pretty good likelihood that you'll have Internet Explorer as a requirement. And the reason for that is that IE and Safari are the last two browsers that don't do rolling releases. So Firefox, new version comes out every six weeks. Chrome, new version comes out every six weeks. Um, all the other ones have these rolling release cycles where as soon as they come out with a new feature, it is available. Internet Explorer and Safari are the last two where like, hey, Safari 13 is out, download and install it. Uh, so the reason that became so popular with the government is, uh, all right, this is a platform. You just run applications on it. Awesome. We want to control every fucking aspect of it. Uh, we don't want people getting a new version of something that we, hasn't gone through our uh, security process or whatever. So I-11 is still like a walled garden that whoever, your IT person can control and prevent you from updating and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the reasons the government still likes that. But, um, yeah, IE doesn't support anything. So if you end up, as a web developer, supporting Internet Explorer, good fucking luck. Uh, the, the whole world feels for you. But uh, for the rest of us, what we have to worry about is Safari, which sucks. Uh, Safari is the new Internet Explorer. Uh, and it, <laughs> it uh, uh, just evolves very, very slowly and like, one of the last things to making that talk that I gave, Progressive Web Apps True, was a, a technology called Service Workers. Um, and Service Workers were only very recently added to uh, Safari. So Service Workers will allow you to have offline apps. And they've been supported by everybody else for a very long time. And Safari, like the worst part about this is that uh, the Safari team wouldn't even say whether or not they would eventually support it. It was under consideration for like three years. And this is where like, you got into the uh, dev world, there's a lot of politics around this. Offline apps, progressive web apps, anybody can just make one and it runs in a browser. That 30% we take off the top from the app store, can't really just do that if it's just somebody's website. Uh, yeah, we're uh, considering the technology, we'll see. 
Yeah. Why did when uh, we throw them or we built the Firefox, is there any real benefit to that? Uh, LearnCo doesn't. I'm in Firefox right now. I thought uh, they had some compatibility issues with Firefox. Yeah. I haven't seen any. I use it on Firefox. It did say at one point we recommend Chrome, but I just ignored it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. <laughs> Uh, Firefox will never use Chromium. Um, this, is a, this is another like interesting political issue in the web world right now. So there's all these different browsers here. Not really though, there's like three. Um, so a browser is an HTML and CSS parsing engine and a JavaScript engine. And then like the button that controls that is here and we have our own plugins ecosystem. Like that gets added on top. But the thing that runs the JavaScript and the thing that runs the HTML, there aren't a ton of different options for those. And so usually you take one wholesale and just drop it into your browser. Um, so the Edge team uh, had maintained one for a while called Chakra. It was pretty fucking good, actually. However, nobody trusts Microsoft to make a browser engine anymore, and so nobody used it. Uh, and so they're like, all right, well, we're not throwing good money after bad anymore. They killed off their engine and started using Chromium. Chromium is the open source version of Chrome, um, which Chrome also uses. Uh, so they're switching over to that, and I, fuck, don't quote me on this, but I feel like Safari is too. Um, and so Mozilla maintains their own one, which is called Quantum. And it's really, really fucking important that that doesn't go away. So the entire, like the entire rest of the ecosystem is all centralizing on Chromium, which sounds like that's a good thing, but it's really not. Because Chromium is still controlled by Google, and um, especially in the last like four or five years, Google has made some very questionable choices about um, the direction of the web. And it's generally agreed that they just have too much fucking influence over how some of these things work. And so the one that uh, the Mozilla Foundation maintains is entirely open source, uh, is truly free, and is really the only bulwark against Google saying like, that's a cool technology, but uh, built-in ad blockers? No, that doesn't work with our business model, so we're not gonna support it. And now the entire web works that way. So the last defense against that is Firefox. Also, there's some really neat tech shit that's coming out of uh, Firefox development. So like, that type ahead, um, kind of thing where like it's making these suggestions in real time. The way that Google does that is it fires it over to their servers and it's processing that against all the other information they know about you and like in real fucking time providing all of that information. Neat, and they're also hijacking your like keystrokes as they're doing that. That's a cool feature though. So the Mozilla team was like, how do we have that feature without um, like logging all your keystrokes and so they have a version of that engine that runs on your computer. Uh, it never actually goes to any like Mozilla server or anything. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Awesome. We're off in the weeds now, but other uh, other questions about what we're doing in mod two? Yeah. Uh, I saw some stuff you put with uh, dollar signs in front of your. Oh yeah. Stuff. Could you explain what that was? Yeah. So that's not in the curriculum. And you can have a happy, healthy career without doing this. But I am of my era, and um, the, a lot of the devs of my era put dollar signs in front of DOM elements. Just indicate that it's not a regular JavaScript variable. So it's a different element in the browser. Do, do modern devs indicate it another way? Or? No. Okay. It's not popular to have that. And like, there's a sort of kind of good reason for that, but. Uh, you'll take it from my cold dead hands. <laughs> I think I think it makes the code easier to read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, make a web app. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you, like, it's not a hard no on that, but you will learn more if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Correct. 
So yeah, since the browser only understands these things, if you're programming in a browser, you're doing it in JavaScript, period. The server, this is just anything that runs on a computer. So that could be JavaScript. That's what Node is. Node is running JavaScript on a server. Um, could be Ruby, could be Python, could be Scala, could be C, could be fucking anything. Um, but your server doesn't have these same limitations. Uh, yeah, Doug. And, and it seems like the next step is the spring of JSON. So uh, sort of HTTP. That's, the, that's what these arrows are. They're network requests. And so I make an HTTP network request over here. I get an HTTP response. And JSON, I know how to work with that. So I can make that back into JavaScript. But that could also be XML. That could be whatever, as long as both of us speak it. Um, I have two questions based on that. So it, it's all HTTP requests and stuff like that. Um, you said they send nothing but strings across Correct. Uh, the web. Um, as far as parsing that, you said there's a couple different options. Like it could be a string of, or it could be JSON, XML, mm -hmm. all, these, all, these, all these other things. How do you control for that? Is it like pretty dynamic? Like if you parse it, it's going to load it, you know, to the Does that make sense? It's an agreement. So um, I, I run the balloons API, I'm the balloon boss, and uh, I only serve my shit in JSON. And so if you want to use my API, you better speak JSON. The good news is that I do. If I was sending back H H uh, XML, I, I actually don't think there's a built-in XML parser, but it'd probably be something like that. Or I could import XML parser from uh, someone's cool XML parser library that they wrote, and then this is just XML parser. But generally speaking, uh, API makes the rules. Whatever format they want to send it back in, that's what we're using. The good news is that for a variety of reasons, JSON uh, is basically the standard. Um, XML's kind of dead because they do the exact same thing and JSON does it with like 40% fewer characters. And we're sending stuff over a network, every character counts. What else? Doug? How do you specify images, videos, all that kind of stuff? Ones and zeros. So it is just all bits. Perfect. Yep. And you go, I am sending you these bits, and by the way, uh, they're JPEGs. You go, cool, I know how to display JPEGs. Give me those bits. And it makes it show up on the screen. Yeah. Um, so is Go a good server-side language, or is that? No. Is it's a great server-side language. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah Go's, Go's pretty popular. Is that, is that all it's used for, or is it just for um, So. That's a good question. A lot of the stuff that we do on the server would fall in the category of like general purpose languages. So um, you can write APIs like we're doing with, uh, with Go. You could also use them to write scripts for your computer. You could use them for honestly any kind of programming task. Um, but I believe that um, serving APIs is like kind of what Google had in mind when they made that. Correct. That's the go, go Google, <laughs> um, and they uh, um, Go is largely like supposed to be a replacement for Java because Java is getting a little long in the tooth. But it does very similar kinds of things. Um, so you said all that changes when you make like uh, iOS app or whatever is just that front part. So you can have an iOS app that runs. Yeah, well, the, the back end. The back end, yeah. Because this boundary right here is like, hey, at this point, we're just speaking HTTP. So if you can make an HTTP request, like, the whole point of this is that you don't know how any of this happens. You just know if I, if I give this code word to this address, I get this data back. Up to you how you do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does it matter so much if the database on the back end? You know, why does it make you a crap whether it's SQLite or 
Sure. Sure. So, uh, great question. Why does any of what this is matter if Ruby's abstract, or Rails is abstracting it out? And the answer is different uh, databases support different data types. So, like, once we're not just doing text and Booleans and shit, uh, Postgres, for example, has uh, native support for geo coordinates. I can do things like calculate the distance between two geo coordinates in your query, lightning fast. That's pretty cool. Um, SQLite cannot do that. <laughs> um, uh, and neither can uh, SQL Server, which is Microsoft's solution to that. And um, MySQL can't do that either. Uh, I believe Oracle can though. So another thing to consider is like when I've got just one of these, MBD. Um, probably doesn't make that much of a difference. When instead I'm talking to a database uh, server that is in charge of keeping all these different copies of this in sync. Um, so these two are copies of each other and this one is some sensitive information and some other kind of shit. And they're like, they might even be physically co-located. Different database systems have different levels of support for that. So like Oracle, that's what it's made for. Um, SQL Server, uh, that's, it's also what it's made for, but they didn't do a very good job. Uh, and then something like Postgres, Postgres is free. It's open software. And so it can do that, but there's like a lower level of support. MySQL and Oracle are both Oracle products. Like you buy licenses for those and you get support and whatever else. Um, and then like different kinds of things, they will perform uh, with different levels of performance. So um, nothing you'll ever need to worry about in this program, but that's why a lot of different alternatives exist. Yeah. Postgres is a good default if you don't have a particular reason to use another one, you should probably use Postgres. It's super robust and it's uh, free and open source. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I would have you do today, we're not gonna have any more lessons today, um, I want you, uh, I've got some links on this, to work on creating APIs. So we're gonna start getting used to the structure of Rails apps. Uh, we have some labs on this. Honestly, if you wanna just follow a tutorial that you find online that sort of speaks to you about Rails APIs, this isn't something that I invented. Like, this is, this is super common. Uh, but I would say if you can, if you're confident with the real simple API shit in like the uh, next couple days, probably on track. I, will, I want you scratching at JavaScript by the end of the week. And then um, you should probably be through the DOM and fetch stuff by the code challenge. There's a tiny, tiny bit of form for the code challenge. Um, but elsewise, like DOM and fetch is kind of really where it's seated. And then we'll get back into like more lessons and shit tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably not much. Um, those those labs are there. You're like yeah. welcome to go through them. I, I release all of them to you. What is Sinatra? Sinatra is. Um, a Ruby server framework without any hand holding. So you just write everything by hand. Uh, if you can rock all of this shit, then uh, I'd recommend trying to do more complicated relationships. So like we don't do like many to many as I think. You, it's the exact same shit though, it's just active record. If you can start doing some of that with Rails, that's cool. If you just snooze right through that, it's Wednesday, and like you're good to go on all that, then I would suggest try doing it in Node. Try doing it in Django. It's the same concepts. And since 
we're just dealing with these HTTP contracts, your browser doesn't care. So if all that stuff is comfortable to you, learn a new language. Yeah? What is the PHP version of Rails you mean? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Laravel. Laravel. Mm -hmm. Python. Mm -hmm. Oh, active. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Apple. Application record. Um, don't think too hard about it. It's, it's in between. This is inheriting from active record. It's giving us one level of abstraction so that I can write a method on application record that this can see, and it's available in all of my models without overwriting something in active record. So they It just gives me a little hook that I can make something that's available to every single one of my models. That real security thing you were doing, mm -hmm. um, is there any place like you can look other than this video this place at what, what that does and how we can do that? Yeah, so that thing that I did was uh, called cores, and I've got lots of videos on it. As does the web. Yeah. I don't think it has a Rails, but it has a web framework. And I believe we have a video on that too, because Roberto just taught it like a week ago. Anything else? This? Yeah. Oh, that's on the website also. Oh. That's uh. That's this. Okay. Uh, I'm missing a couple uh, assessments. If you're assessment inclined, including this first one, uh, your assessment is: Can you do all three CRUD actions on a model? Yep. Where does the AWS fit in on a diagram of like the other server and the database? Great question. It's where all of these when they're not on my computer anymore. Well, I gotta have somewhere to put it. If you want to see my my shit, Heroku is built on top of AWS. So if I want you to be able to see this stuff, I need some computers to run them on. Amazon just they're commodities. They're not special. You don't. How, how this used to work is you'd have your IT department go to CDW and like get a bunch of computers and plug them into the wall and install hard drives and shit. That's dumb. There's no value add for a company doing that themselves. Like this is pure commodity work. And so Amazon's cool thing was like, neat, we have a billion of those and I can give you one in 20 seconds. And the, uh, for a frame of reference, when I started in this industry and I asked for a server from Pearson, uh, I was told six to eight weeks, we'll have a server set up for you. Now you can literally do that with an HTTP request is indeed. It's probably like one of the most like economically transformational things uh, of the last 20 years. You have a small business, you don't have to hire that person anymore to set that shit up for you. You just, and it, the best part of this too is it, you can change the scaling on it. So you pay, I don't know, 20 cents an hour or something to run this computer. Oh no, your Super Bowl ad just aired, cool. More computer please, and you like move a slider and now you have it. Pretty badass. Yeah, the, uh, everybody's in that game now. Microsoft's is called Azure, and Google's is called uh, Google Cloud Compute or something like that. N neither of them are nearly as popular as Amazon's though. Which is too bad, because all of those are easy to use, and Amazon's is dog shit. It's like the least usable application I've ever used. The docs are spread across like five different sites that disagree with it. I hate it so much. But they won. Yeah. Uh, re rephrase that. So like, uh, so you have your traffic script. Yeah. Ruby on your front end, and you can make that with CSS and HTML. No, no Ruby on the front end. This is the front end, just JavaScript. Okay. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, but it's still the same. So when you go to the server side on the back end, can you stack uh, different frameworks there? Just across different APIs, and then you need to do something like that? Kind of. So like with something like Sinatra, 
you probably would. With Rails, the whole point of Rails is that it's all in wonder. Uh, you just get a kit that you can build your API out of. Something like Sinatra is more like a la carte. It's like, I'll use this to handle my web requests. I'm going to use this for my authentication. I'm going to use this for this and this for this. And you sort of, you're responsible for stitching them all together yourself. Um, so there's a popular server pattern right now called um, uh, microservices. And there's a particular version of that called uh, Lambdas, or function as a service. And what's cool about that is you make an HTTP request not to a Rails application, you make it to a function. And that function just calls and it gives you its return value. And the way that Amazon does theirs is like you pay per function call. And so it is like the most tightly scaled thing I can imagine. You just pay every time that that function gets called. And the best part about that is it doesn't matter what language you wrote it in. You have every single one of these lambdas written in a different language. And so. For mod two, but um, okay. mod four, mod five, I do that. Cool. I wrote some lambdas. I wrote some lambdas in my day. Yeah. Um, no, I'd love to uh, love to talk about that. So yeah, like for example, JavaScript is dog shit at money. Like any math, honestly, you cannot do math with JavaScript. And if you don't believe me, check this shit out. <laughs> about to blow your mind. All right. 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, that should be, oh, what? <laughs> Seems like the one thing that a computer should be good at, but. Um, so don't write your bank, your bank application in JavaScript. <laughs> um, the, but like Python, Python's pretty good with math. It's not good at, honestly, much of anything else, but it is pretty good at uh, math. So you can pick the right tool for every teeny part of your application. That's pretty badass. If every one of those was Rails, Rails is bad. Rails is it's just a very slow way to approach that. Now, if you need all of the things that it offers, it's the most efficient way to do all of that. But if all you're doing is calling a function, it's the slowest possible way to do that. If Pound for pound, the equivalent thing that you stitch together, the likelihood that you'll do it as performant as Rails is very low. Not impossible, but it's a low likelihood that you're going to do it better than they did. Cool, we're way over. So um, hopefully everybody knows what they're doing today. Cool. Team up. Give it a shot. See if you can learn this together. Going to be well.